This is the first Sunday of Advent. We're going to be doing things a little differently through the Advent season. You've already noticed that in your bulletin. It's not the traditional folded bulletin. We have more more stuff to put in there. We could have put it all in the traditional bulletin, but it would have been about an eight-point font, which would have been very hard to read. So uh, this is better. Um, But uh, you'll notice that's a little different. I just wanted to, I'm going to give you one Sunday to prepare you for it. Um, And then after that, we're going to hit it just nice and smooth and everything like that. So uh, just follow along in your bulletins. You'll see the next uh, thing as it comes up, and we will celebrate this season It's good to have you home. How was it? It was good? I'll talk to you later about that, but I'm glad to see you. So, okay, I'm getting out of the way. Morning. Let's all stand and sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. This is a Sunday for hope, and these are all songs talking about the hope of Jesus coming. is the conviction that things could be better. The, that the way the world is isn't the way that it has to be. In a darkening world, hope is a light that the darkness cannot overcome. Hope reminds us of one who has come and will come. Hope. Today we light the candle of hope. Cyrus, would you please? Good morning. As light served at the advent of creation, the greater and the lesser lights, we celebrate the light of hope this morning. Would you pray with me, please? Christ, we enter this morning the advent of something, something bright and beautiful. Something to be grasped while yet equally incomprehensible. Lord, as we awake to the light of this day, and as we gather in the light of the candle, may we gather our hearts held in the light of you this morning. In your name, amen. Romans, chapter 8, verse 18 through 25. The words of Paul. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation 
was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in pain, of childbirth right up until the very present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is no hope at all. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Correction. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Lots of papers. Come thou long expected Jesus.
It's been a while since I've done this, so I might be doing this a little out of order. Um, but as we prepare ourselves to receive gifts this morning, would you join with me in prayer? Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for the gifts that have been presented to us. And I ask for the wisdom as we seek to be a church that cares, nourishes, and provides. And the gifts that have been given, God, they are blessings, resources for us to do just that. Not as an institution, but as a community together. Wisdom be upon our hearts as we enter a season of joy, of hope, and of giving. Wisdom for the gifts that we have been given today. In your name, amen. We receive these gifts, Lord. God is in your wisdom. In your name, amen. Okay, there it is. From Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing in the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood, will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it, with justice and righteousness. And from that time on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The Lord bless the reading of his word. I'm glad they came back in. Let's do the kid's story. Come on, Grayson. Come on, Nancy. Good morning, Nancy. How are you? <laughs> They're watching you. Hello. So today is the first Sunday of Advent. You guys know what Advent means? Kind of a little bit. It's basically when we get ready for Christmas, which seems kind of weird because what did we do this last week? We just had Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, we're already on to Christmas. But that's just the way the calendar was this year, and it's okay. But the first Sunday of Advent is the Sunday that we celebrate hope. Do you guys know what hope is? A little bit, maybe? Uh, I do. You do. You've got an idea. I've got a way to maybe help you understand a little deeper about what hope is, okay? 
So here's my question. Is there somebody on that phone? Is it ringing? <laughs> it's for you. All right. So how many of you have been sick before? You've been sick before? How many, have you guys been sick before? Yeah? You know what being sick is like, right? So here's my question. Are you still sick? No. No, you got better, right? Yes. Yeah, sometimes when we get sick, we're like, oh, I don't know if this is ever going to be done. Oh, I feel so bad. Oh, it's awful. I wish I could be done with this. <sighs> and it takes a long time to get better sometimes when we're not very well. Okay, but you know what? Hope is thinking that eventually if I'm sick, I'm going to get better. That's hopeful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most of the time when we get sick, we get better. That's having hope. You know that something as bad as it is, as rough as it is when you're sick, you're going to get better. All right? So that's what I want you guys to think about. If you've ever been sick and you got better, then you know what hope is like. Hope is knowing that things can be better. Well, kind of. I hope I'm not sick would be a good way to think of that. Or I hope that this sick doesn't last forever. Yes. And you've all gotten better. And that's because hope brings us through the difficult times. All right. Are they going to call back later? Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us hope. Giving us reminders that as bad as things seem to us right now, that there's something better in the future that you have provided for us and that you promise we can enjoy. We want to look forward with hope to the, the better future that you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go. I wanted to thank our ladies for the beautiful decorations that we have. Did you notice this back here? Let us adore him. That's, that's different. We haven't done that before in our old holy night. So thank you, ladies, that do all this hard work. Uh, maybe some gentlemen were here, too. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to sing I Heard the Bells. But before we start, I just wanted, I'm sure some of you know the story, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Let me just review it. I think it's so touching. It was written in December, Christmas Day, on 1864. This is an old song. It was first a poem written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And it was during the Civil War, the American Civil War. And tragedy struck both the nation and the Longfellow family in 1861. His wife, Fanny was fatally burned in an accident. A flame, a spark, hit on her dress and she, they didn't realize it. And so her whole dress burst up into flame. And um, Henry tried to take a rug and wrap it around her and put the fire out, but it didn't go out. So then he grabbed his, put his arms around her and hugged her tight to himself and put the flames out. Um, this putting his arms around her, obviously, got the fire on him. And he was burned tragically on his face and his arms and his chest. Uh, she died the next morning. And because of his grasping her, he had these scars. And you know, every time you see a picture of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, he has a full-grown beard because he couldn't shave after the burn that came. That's one tragedy. Then another one, almost a year later, his son was in the army fighting, and he was very badly wounded. Um, he, he was severely wounded that it was a, a lifelong handicap for him. He did not die. Sometimes people think that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote the poem because of the death of his son. He, but he had to live with his handicap for the rest of his life. And one Christmas morning, he's listening to the, the Christmas bells as they're ringing, Peace on Earth. 
And he said to himself, in the third verse, And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, for hate is strong and mocks the song. But the bells kept ringing, and it struck his heart. And in the fourth verse, he goes on, The bells pealed more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. And thus the message that the living God is a God of peace. His poem was changed into a song a couple years later, and that's the song that we have, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. So this whole, we're going to sing all five verses. It's a really short song. And I want you to pay attention to the, the words and what he's saying. It's the whole story right here in this song. So let's stand you get better breathing if you stand and you can really sing here. <laughs> I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And wild and sweet the words repeat on earth good will to men I thought how as the day it got the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along on broken song a peace on earth good will to men and Hope is the belief that things will be better. Now, faith sometimes gets better press than hope. We want faith. Faith is strong. Faith moves mountains. And we might think that we're settling if we settle for hope. But don't count hope out. Hope is too powerful. In Dante's poem, Inferno, Dante is led through hell by that ancient Roman poet, Virgil. And at the beginning of the story, as they come to the gates of hell, there's a stone there that bears the inscription, Abandon all hope, you who enter here. Dante understood. The absence of faith may lead one to hell, but the absence of hope is hell. Hell is the place where there is no sense that things can be better. But in order for there to be something better, someone has to make that possible. The Jews, for all of the struggles they had, for all of their faithlessness, 
that we see from Scripture, the Jews were above all a people of hope. And this hope was born from the conviction that God was on their side. And that as bad as things got, God was going to make everything right. Simeon is perhaps the perfect example of this hope. In the second chapter of Luke, we have this story of the faithful old prophet waiting year after year for the coming of the Messiah. Now, Simeon knew the words of Isaiah. He was looking for that day when finally the people who had been walking in darkness would see that great light. He was anticipating that time of joy when a joy of the nation that would be increased when the, the yoke and the burden and the rod of oppression would be broken. He was looking for the child to be born, the one who would be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. To be a people of promise, a people of covenant, this is a wonderful thing. Of all of the nations, God chose Israel. Deuteronomy 7 tells it. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. Out of all of the people who are on the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But the Lord, because the Lord loved you, and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. You see, when God makes a promise, God keeps it. And so there's always been this promise, this covenant, this hope that as bad as things got for the Jews, that God would one day fix it. When the Jews were faithless and exiled, God remained faithful. The promise still held. Justice and righteousness would one day be established and upheld by that one who would sit on David's throne. Things would be better. And so Simeon had hope. Still, hope can be hard to maintain. How long it had, been, had it been for them? There had been a short time, about a century and a half back, when it looked like everything was coming together. It was all happening in front of them when the promise was being revealed. Judas the hammer had wrestled control of Judea from the Greeks, and for a short period of time, a Jew ruled in Jerusalem again. But it was a short time. Rome was rising, taking advantage of the division within the Hasmonean house. The Roman Senate put Herod the Great in charge. It was just one more disappointment in a long line of thwarted expectations. You see, things had not been good for the children of Israel for centuries, maybe all the way back to the time of David. Maybe it was getting hard for them to have hope. I guess that Simeon was something of a character, really, an oddball, that prophet who kept jabbering on in the temple courts about the coming Messiah and the consolation of Israel. Well, everything around him was really pretty bad. Even though they knew that there was this covenant that they had with God, most Jews probably, like the rest of us, just wanted to make the best of things, to get along as well as they could under the control of Rome. After all, this was everything that they had known and all their people had known for centuries. You see, they were supposed to be God's special possession, but they were really more of a plaything, a pawn for empires. Where, where was God when Rome did everything that it wanted? You see, for there to be hope, that sense that things could be better, there has to be a belief that someone is capable of making that possible. Judas Maccabees, the hammer, he tried, but his family ultimately failed. Herod, as great as his buildings were, was still just a puppet of Rome. And Rome itself, well, it was certainly more interested in their own benefit than the betterment of Judea. So where does hope come from? 
for a people under the thumb of empire, an empire that didn't care, where was hope? For a people who knew all about the promises that had been made, but it had lost sight of the one who had made them, where was hope? Maybe the Jews were in danger of slipping into that hellish existence where hope had been abandoned. It had been so long. There had been so many failures, so many disappointments as they waited for the consolation. Circumstances, situations, empires had conspired against them year after year. God, God didn't seem to be the living, loving Lord that had chosen them out from among all the nations. God seemed to be, I don't know, an abstraction, an idea that was debated by the scribes and the religious leaders. Where is hope when there doesn't seem to be anybody that can make things better? More than a few people probably thought Simeon was just some crazy old coot, jabber, 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 hung around the temple muttering about the Lord's promise. When's that going to happen, Simeon? Hope was something for guys like him, religious zealots, who not, not something that normal people can use in everyday life. But imagine for a moment that God is telling the truth. Obviously, one has to believe in God for that to be a possibility. Believing in God is the living, loving Lord and not just an abstraction, a theological concept debated by religious experts. You see, God has to be more than that. God has to be personal and real and intimately concerned with those he's chosen for God's integrity to matter at all. But for a moment, imagine, think about what life would be like if God could be trusted if Isaiah's words were more than just a poetic reflection, that light really was going to dawn on those living in a land of darkness. If God's telling the truth and can be trusted to keep his promises, then what does that do to hope? I think Paul understood this better than most, probably because God, Paul knew that God wasn't a theological abstraction, wasn't just an idea, but was a personal, intimate, loving God. Paul knew this. Paul had encountered the risen Christ himself, had seen Jesus with his own eyes that, that were blinded for a moment, and he knew, he knew that God was telling the truth. And so when he writes this letter to the Romans, the scripture that, that Stephen read earlier, he writes... He writes to them about hope. Present sufferings. How many of you are encountering present sufferings? Present sufferings, he says, they're nothing. They are nothing. They are not worth comparing to that better thing that's coming. Even creation itself is anticipating that better thing. Even creation has hope. What we're experiencing right now what the whole world is experiencing, this present suffering, that is not all there is. We are going to get better. We won't stay sick. Because things can be better. And there's someone who can make them better. Now this seems like a really simple thing, doesn't it? Just believe in God, trust that what God has promised is true, and live in hope. But there's a lot that's packed into those suppositions. One of the very first things that we struggle with is what it means to believe in God. Accepting the possibility that there's some sort of a divine entity out there, a prime mover, as Aristotle put it, that's not really enough. You see, if God is who God has revealed himself to be, then that divine entity, the, the, the prime mover, that's only part of who God is. That is only part of his character. God is also the one who walks with his creation in the cool of the day. God is also the one who is grieved in his heart when his people disobey and are wicked. God is the one who makes irrevocable promises 
to those he loves. You see, God is a lot more powerful, a lot more trustworthy, and believe me, a lot closer and more involved in our lives than we might think. You see, the one who set the very foundations of the world, the one who hung the stars in the sky, the one who breathed life into everything that lives is also the one that cares about you and me and cares about what we do and how we live. The God of the, of the cosmos makes and keeps promises with humans. That ought to shake you a little bit. Believing that God is both transcendent and intimate. Both supremely powerful and tenderly loving. Means that God is capable of making things better. And he has the heart and the passion and the desire to do it. Next, we may struggle with understanding the promises. God, who is transcendently powerful and intimately loving, has made promises. But when God covenants with humanity, when God has a promise that he's going to keep, it is God who shapes that covenant. It is God who sets the terms of the promise. It's not up to us. It's not ours to try to get God to do what we want him to do. This is where I think Simeon was really faithful. There were a great many of Jews at that time who really wanted to get out from underneath Rome. They wanted to be free from the Roman impression. But Simeon, Simeon was simply waiting for the Messiah. For Simeon, the Messiah would not be just a glory for Israel, but he would be a light for the Gentiles too. The Messiah would cause the rising and falling of many who thought they had it all figured out. Now the popular concept of the Messiah was that it was going to be all good for the Israelites. And so Simeon sensed something when he sensed Jesus in his presence. He sensed something both narrower and broader. Narrow in the sense that the self-serving ideas of many in Israel would not be realized in the way that they expected. Broader in the sense that many outside of Israel would also be illuminated by the light of the Messiah. You see, Simeon was open to the way that God wanted to fulfill this promise. He wasn't interested in trying to force God to meet his expectations. He wasn't interested in saying, I want this to turn out the way that I want it to turn out. You see, we can't really reach that better future if we don't accept that God's better really is better. This is why it is so important for us to hold on to hope, to grab a hold of hope, particularly in this season. Because to hope, even in the midst of all that seems so hopeless, means we really do believe that something can be better. Nothing in this world is going to promise you what God promises you. Nothing in this world will promise you what God promises. No government, no political party, no social structure, no public policy, no possession, no amount of wealth, no prosperity, no worldly wisdom at all can surpass the better that God promises. And to, to hope for that promise, to groan in anticipation for the freedom that God has prepared for his children, to long for what cannot be seen and to wait for it patiently, this is a testament to our belief in God and that his promises are good. You see, we're not all that different than the Jews. Many of us have the same idea. We have a sense that somewhere inside us that we're special. We're special in God's eyes, whether it's a, an accident of birth or from having grown up in a religious home or because of a decision that we made somewhere along the course of our lives. We've got this feeling that God has made us some promises too. But you know, we still need Simeon. We still need Simeon in our life because 
we can get just as confused about what all that means. We can get just as, as, as convoluted in our ideas about the Messiah as the people were when Jesus was first born. You see, we can do the same thing. Start treating God like an abstraction, a theological principle, something way off at a distance that doesn't really impact our lives that much. Doesn't have any bearing on how we actually live our lives. We can put our trust in our own strength. I'll get this sorted. I'll figure this out. I'll do the work. We can put our, our trust in our institutions. Yep, I can, I can have, back that up. We do that instead of trusting God. We often live as if we're the masters of our own destiny. I'll take care of it. I'll do it. I'll do it the way I want to do it. And we lose sight of the ruler of the cosmos. How many of us actually live as if the very creator of the universe matters? I mean, think about the choices that we make on a day-to-day basis. How many of us live as if God were that close and that intimate as well as that transcendent and powerful? Does it matter to us that, that God has chosen us for his own? Does it matter to us that he loved us enough to send his son? So that we could be saved? Shouldn't that truth about who God is have an impact on everything that we do, our conversations with other people about things that we want and what is right? And that is who God is. And shouldn't we trust the way that God wants to fulfill the promises that He's made? Shouldn't we trust God? You see, if God wants to love, you know, those people, you know who I'm talking about, those people. If God wants to love those people, and not just us, shouldn't that be something we accept? If God wants to pull us away from that idolatrous passion and the love of the things of this world so that we can live something better, shouldn't that be our desire too? You see, life's got plenty of trouble right now, right? I can get an amen from that. Life's got some trouble. That's a fact. And whether the intensity of this trouble and the frequency of this trouble is increasing, ramping up, maybe an indication of the hastening of days, or whether the trouble that we're experiencing is just the the current day's mess, the, the manifestation of what everybody throughout history has always experienced, That's an academic question. It doesn't matter. Because both are true. The days are hastening forward towards the fulfillment of God's plan. And we groan inwardly in anticipation. And, as Paul tells the Corinthians, there is no temptation that has overtaken us that is not common to humanity. So regardless of where you stand on that, regardless of your perspective there, trouble is here. Trouble is all around us. Our present suffering is a reality. And so the promise of something better, that's a pretty important promise to hold on to. We need it. Because in all the trouble, we get lost. We lose our way. We can forget who holds the future. We can try to wrestle control of situations and do things our way. We can, we can grab them away from our enemies like Judas the hammer and only to fail to redeem the situation ourselves. We may even make a bigger mess than it was before. You see, we need to hope that there's something better. We need Simeon to remind us that what God is planning is better is better than anything that we can concoct in our, mind, in our brain. Are you feeling hopeful? I hope you are. Because hope is critical for a well-lived life. You have to have hope. Some might even say that it is essential for life itself. Dostoevsky, the Russian novelist, he reflected on hope in Dante's Inferno. He said, totally without hope, one cannot live to live without hope is to cease to live hell is hopelessness it's no accident that above the entrance to Dante's hell is the inscription leave behind all hope you who enter here 
today on this first Sunday of, of Advent, we reflect on hope. We think about hope. We try to embrace hope. But we should be careful not to treat hope as a once-a-season thing any more than we want to treat gratitude as a once-a-season thing. That would be like sitting down to that Thanksgiving meal that you all hopefully had, that giant feast, eating it all, having hope, and then going about the rest of the year hungry. Keep hope in front of you. Hope should live with us all the time because we need hope to live. And since hope is, the, is, is founded on this conviction that things don't have to stay the way that they are, that they can be better, then we should also live sheltered in the presence of the one who can do it. The one who can make that possible. The one that will truly inspire hope. God is who God has revealed himself to be. And God promises, his promises are sure and secure and better than anything that we could come up with on our own. And there's no more profound proof of that than the baby that Simeon held in his arms. That old prophet waiting for consolation. This is the one, he says. This is the one we've been waiting for. And he won't be what we expect. May not be what we want. He'll be more. And he's going to be the one that brings something better. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this hope that you give. May it flourish in our hearts. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. In your order of service, I want to invite you to join me in this reading. It too is a prayer. God of promise, come into our darkness, renew your hope in us, for you alone bring life out of death. Receive God's promise of hope from Psalm 33. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song, Angels We Have Heard on High.
one but Brett. Bow with me again. Lord, we are your people, the sheep of your pastures. You have called us, you have welcomed us, you have embraced us, you have loved us. You are closer to us than we can imagine, and you are powerful enough to make things better. So Lord, we ask that you would lead us into the world. You would give us opportunities to share that love with others, to embrace the downtrodden, the lonely, and those in need of you. And Lord, help us to live a life that testifies to the reality that something better is coming. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in hope.